We're back here on Inside the Ropes. We are joined by a man who has done it all in wrestling and now he is the GM of SmackDown, just trash talking Roman Reigns all over the place. It's Nick Aldis. Nick, how you doing? I I think trash talking is a, a, a maybe a, a slightly uh, sensationalistic way to describe it, Kenneth. I think uh, I think I think we've had a, a, a good frank uh, exchange of ideas and philosophies is the way I would say it. But you see, that's that's executive speak. Yeah, that is. Well, hopefully we don't get too much executive speaking in this interview, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> so a couple of months ago, you know, it was reported widely, you know, Nick Ald is coming to WWE as a producer. It was making the rounds everywhere. People were very surprised by the news that that is something that would be happening. Can you kind of talk me through how that happened, the decision to do it? So I, uh, you know, I, I gave my notice with the NWA uh, last year, you know, in uh, like November of last year, and I um made it clear to WWE I reached out to um Paul Levesque and Bruce Pritchard and and said that I was going to be a free agent you know as of January the 1st and and uh I would love to you know explore any opportunities with WWE um we had some you know brief but positive conversations uh and it was you know implied uh that at that time, uh, you, know, you know, things were a little bit uh, unpredictable on the corporate side, um, you know, which obviously, as we turned out, you know, <laughs> as we as we later uh, discovered was, you know, the impending uh, sale and, you know, the sort of shift, uh, you know, management and responsibilities and all that sort of stuff. So it was sort of suggested to me, um, hey, go and you know stay busy for a bit and you know let, let's let's circle back uh in a few months when things are a bit more clear all right so i did i went and did some stuff did, had my little run with impact which i thought went really well um and then um during that during that time uh bruce called me and said how do you feel about being a producer um he said look I, you know i know it's probably not what you had in mind but uh it's something that we can do right away you know it's something we can we can we can get you in you know sooner as a producer um and i look that you know this and and people who are who who are familiar with with my contributions um beyond just a talent you know know that i have i have taken a lot of pride in a lot of my contributions behind the scenes um, at the NWA and, and, uh, you know, impact and, you know, anywhere else I've been. Um, so it, it's always been something that I had one eye on. It was always something that I figured that I would end up doing. Um, so the opportunity to do it, you know, with the, the number one company is <laughs> obviously something that I would have, uh, hopefully seen myself doing at some point. Uh, so I basically said, look, I, I made a point when I reached out to Paul the first time um, that I wanted an opportunity to contribute to WWE in any way that I could, right? I was at a point where I felt like I had put in my 10,000 hours and uh, from a sort of professional standpoint, I wanted to contribute to the number one company, Right. Like I wanted to contribute my experience, my expertise, my philosophies. Um, I wanted to contribute to the to the number one place. You know, I felt like one way or another, I belonged in 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 the bigs. Um, and if that meant, you know, on the other side of the aisle, so to speak, then so be it. And um, so when that came up, I sort of said, well, I can't be a hypocrite. And I, you know, and I'm not going to. I, I can't say that and then turn around and go, oh, well, I was really hoping to be a wrestler first, <laughs> you know? So I said, great, let's do it. Um, and, you know, truthfully, I made peace with the idea that like, I'll, I'll, I'll enjoy this job and I'll be good at it. Um, and if anything else comes along, then so be it. But uh, I came in there with, you know, an open mind and an open heart and just um, was ready to contribute. I mean, it feels, if, you know, from an outsider perspective, this feels different to, say, let's let's use Adam Pierce as an example. When he became a producer. It kind of felt like 
to the outside. Adam Pierce was kind of done as a wrestler and he was kind of at peace with moving into that. With you, while, you know, I'm sure you are a very good producer behind the scenes, it does not seem like the, the door is completely closed in the wrestling aspect. So I guess from your perspective, were you just thinking, this is the way in, I'm, I'm going to do it. And like you said, you know, you're, you want to contribute in any way. And if you're going to potentially wrestle in WWE, this is probably the way to do it. I didn't think like that. That would, to me, that would be, uh, that would be ill-advised um, because, you you know, to be an effective producer, you have to be 100% committed to helping the, the, the talent roster be the biggest stars they can be, right? And uh, I think, I think that that would, that would cause, you know, you, that, that would cause a, a, a split in focus where you would be sort of constantly harboring this sort of resentment or, or hope, you know, that, that oh, I'm just putting in my time to, you know, until, until it, it's my turn to, to be a wrestler. You, you can't think like that. Um, no, I absolutely went in 100% uh, with the idea that this is my, this is my job now. Um, and I will say, uh, you know, I'm a climber by nature, right? Like I'm going to be wherever I am, I'm going to immediately start looking up, you know, okay, what's the next level up? Like, what's the, you know, how do I, how, do, how can I progress to the next level here? How can we like, what's, you know, what's the, what's the correct path, uh, you know, to progress. So I sort of had this internal dialogue where I said, okay, if it's the employee side of things, then so be it. But my, now my intention will be to rise through the ranks of WWE on the corporate side. Um, and I still have that ambition. I still have that thought. And uh, the first step to that is being as effective a producer as I can be and, and being part of the team and learning um you know, the WWE way, the WWE system, because look, there's, and I know this is a cliche thing and I, and I feel like people, a lot of people say uh, stuff to the effect of what I'm about to say without really fully understanding it, but there's pro wrestling and then there's WWE, like the, the, the sheer scale of operation at WWE is just, uh, it's, there, there is no comparison, and that's not a knock to any other wrestling company or any, you know, any other sports entertainment organization. There is no comparison to the WWE, you know, monster, the WWE machine. Like I go to work, and there are, you know, hundreds of people uh, involved um, in making this thing happen. Meaning, that, you know, a live television broadcast, and there's a whole other set of people who are in Stanford who, you know, who we never see, you know? Um, and, you know, it's going to take me months and months to just to remember everybody's name, you know, and just to remember what everybody does and just to remember, okay, if I have a, if I have a question about this particular thing, that's the guy I go to. If I have a question about this particular thing, that's the guy I go to. Everybody in WWE has a very specific, role you know and a very specific responsibility which differentiates it from any other uh company in the sense that in, in, in most pro wrestling you know there's always a, a a fair amount of sort of shared responsibility you know people wear multiple hats um and not to say that there aren't people in wwe who do that but for the most part like there's an expert in every single field <laughs> Uh, yeah. you know and they are delegated to and it is like you know they all feed together with you know certain people who are who who are tasked with sort of um collecting all of those expertise and then you know and funneling it all into the overall direction you know one being obviously Paul Levesque uh one was Kevin Dunn before Kevin's departure and you know and then you have guys like Michael Hayes who to me is you know arguably you know i would i would put michael hayes up there as one of the most valuable assets that the company has um you know and bruce and you know any number of people who sort of 
who learn the way that the, the who know about every single part of WWE to the point where now they are qualified to be able to herd everybody, you know. So I'm I'm very much like on level one, and I'm sort of okay. I'm mastering this particular element of it, and obviously I'm being, uh, you know, called upon to use my my expertise for lack of a better word when it comes to ring psychology and you know presentation and delivery of um moments and you know fi like physicality right like so, so, you know if it were if it were a movie or a tv show you'd call it stunt coordinating right it's like that's that's my primary responsibility at this point outside of my role as an, as an on-screen talent um but obviously uh you know those those two things are separate like but and, and like i said before i before i got the call about the general manager opportunity um you know i was i was very much you know committed to learning this particular role and mastering it so that when the time is right i could make the move to try to you know move up the ladder on the corporate side so talk about you know you come in you're a producer and then all of a sudden there's the opportunity to be the, the smackdown gm is there hesitation is it an immediate yes what's the thought process zero hesitation <laughs> <laughs> uh, i said yes immediately um i was very happy to get the opportunity you know i got the, um i had uh i had been uh it was smackdown in hershey i remember it was hershey pennsylvania because it was uh, that was where Cena um, came back, I think. And so there was, look, John Cena is John Cena. There was a def, there was there was already a different sort of atmosphere that day, you know. Anyway, it was there was a sort of there was a level of excitement, and there was a sort of everyone had the sort of dialed in kind of uh, attitude. Um, so obviously, everybody is at production meeting, and and look, you know, like I said, I'm <laughs> I'm like level one, so I'm just like. I'm. I, I arrived, you know, 15 minutes early. I, I don't say much. I sort of, I nod a lot, and you know, uh, and and just sort of try to keep my eyes and ears open. But um, Bruce uh, pulled me out of the meeting that day and said, uh, "How are you feeling about everything?" I said, "Great." I said, "I'm enjoying it." He said, "Well, great. You're you're you know everybody's pleased with your with the work you're doing." And he goes, "Let me ask you this: uh, how, how are you feeling physically?" And I said, I feel good. I feel fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, I, you know, I think because I had had a back injury in the summer, um, which, you know, I had unfortunately had to pull out of a couple of independent shows that I had booked. Uh, and so I think that they had kept an eye on that as a sort of like, you know, are you injured or are you, you know, or are you hurt? You know, there's a difference. And I said, no, I was just, I was just hurt. Like I, I, I went and got checked out had you know no no major issues it was just an inflammation and you know just needed some rest or whatever and uh he said okay good he's all right because uh we've got something in mind you know the typical sort of bruce uh <laughs> delivery right like not giving away too much um he goes but uh i think you're gonna like it i said okay you know and, and a few weeks went by where i didn't hear any more about it and i didn't press uh and then um he called me and i was at home and he said uh smackdown general manager i think you'd be great for it and hunter thinks you'd be great for it i said i think i'd be great for it too <laughs> it sounds good you know and obviously there were you know, obviously the, and, and they sort of you know they they made me the offer for you know the money and what it would look like you know now as a sort of combined deal right like a talent agreement and a and a uh employee agreement as a producer and they sort of went through the and i just said look it's all good like just let's just let's go let's make it happen you know like you know i, I just need to uh, uh let, let's get stuck in i'm ready to go i also think it's it's, it's kind of fascinating how that debut as the smackdown gm happened right because it, you didn't come out to a big titan tron with music you know you kind of appear at ringside and then you have that line to Dominic Mysterio which just floored the crowd um talk about that line and kind of the way that you were introduced which you know was kind of different to how you would expect in your mind as a fan that yeah. it may happen so look um I've always said and if you could go back and find other interviews that I've given 
where I've said, I believe that one of the key uh, qualities you have to have to succeed in this industry, not necessarily as a talent, but just to succeed in the industry period is self-awareness, right? In other words, you have to know what you do well, you have to know what you don't do well, and you have to, and you have to know um, where you stand, right? As far as like your status and everything. So I understood that for me to come out with music and entrance and everything like that, particularly in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and, and that's, you know, not a knock on Tulsa, Oklahoma, but, you know, uh, there are certain markets where I would have got a stronger reaction, right? Like New York, Philly, um, you know, the places that have a stronger concentration of fans that are following, you know, a lot more um, wrestling than just WWE. Uh, so I understood and look, uh, Hunter and I discussed it at length and he got, and you know, he was, Paul was very, you know, honest about it. And he goes, look, I know that it's, he said, there, that there, there is no real, there is no ideal way to do this. He goes, we just feel like this is the, this is the best way to avoid, you know, uh, he's like, you know, we cut, he goes, you know, music and entrance doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, look, because most of the WWE audience are not familiar with me right well they are now but you know that but at the time it's like very out of the blue and they and i'm using my real name and it's like it's you know i think hunter looked at it as like look let's rip the band-aid off right like <laughs> there's there's uh there's no easy way to do this that's not going to be a little bit awkward so let's get it out the way and then he just said and i'm going to give you the mic right away and you just and 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 you get over do you know what i mean like you once you talk, like, you'll be okay. And that's how I felt about it. I was like, <laughs> you know, the, the sooner I can get in the ring and forget that part, the better, right? Like, just give me the mic. And um, uh, we, uh, I worked with Zach, who was the writer on that segment. And we sort of kick in a couple of ideas back and forth. And, you know, there was just this one, there was just this sort of one, I what I saw as this one opportunity to sort of you know to, to make a little bit of a statement about like who I could, who I was going to be in this role uh so I worked with Zach on it and said I think it's this I think it's this line to Dom you know I think I can I think I can kind of make this like I think I can sort of make that the focal point I think that can be my sort of one little moment you know uh and we played around with it and you know credit full credit to Don Mysterio because who would have thought that I'm in a so you know just just to put this into into perspective uh I'm making my television debut for WWE with one of my idols Triple H and for me the thing I saw as the most valuable thing for me to establish my character was Dominic Mysterio Right. Like, obviously, yes, you're getting the endorsement from Triple H and that's going to help me in, in terms of credibility. Mm -hmm. But in terms of something that could give me a chance to get a reaction, like the Dominic Mysterio was was the necessary party in that equation, you know, and that's a real testament to Dom. I mean, because like what, an, you know, I mean, if he's not, I, I mean, if he's not the most improved, fastest rising star, I don't know who is. Because like that kid is he's special, but um, so thankfully you know he he his heat is so so strong that I had the opportunity to deliver that line and I had good timing on it and I you know I was without patting myself on the back too hard I was not concerned about my delivery <laughs> uh, and yeah and and for me I felt like okay like that was my that was my sort of that was me kicking the door in right with the WWE universe that was me that my way of going like this is the this is the Smackdown general manager character like I mean because you have that that big debut it goes so well and kind of week after week you know the way that you're carrying yourself on screen the way that you're interacting with characters on the show it doesn't feel like a submissive general manager type person with this like roster who's bullying the authority person it feels different and obviously we got the randy orton rko that he hit you with um i mean everybody after that was going well 
you know, he's taken an RKO now. That's that means it's coming. Were you aware when it was kind of told, you know, you're going to take the RKO that fans were maybe going to start to chatter at that point because you got physical? I guess, I guess so. I, I mean, but I think that chatter had already begun. Um, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm very grateful to the fans out there who were familiar with me, you know, because you, you have to remember, like, it's a, it's a, it's a weird juxtaposition that I was, I was in when I debuted as a GM because to a large portion of the WWE universe that they don't know who I am. So they're just kind of like, okay, who's this guy? Right. Like, you know, and well, all we know about him is that he's the SmackDown general manager. And then maybe they do a Google search, right. Or whatever, or, you know, they go on Twitter and then it's kind of like, they start piecing together a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a bio, biography of me. Right. And, but for those who were familiar with me, there was this sentiment immediately of, huh? Like, <laughs> why is he that? You know, like that, that's not what we expected. So it was, it's funny because I sort of, I had, I had to sort of win over two different groups of people at the same time. And I, like I said, like, like I alluded to before, I had already made a promise to myself that like, whatever they threw at me, I was just going to go, yes, you know, I'll do it and I'll kill it. Like I'll do, I'll do the, I'll be, if you want me to be a producer, I'll be the best producer I can be. If you want me to be a, you know, a referee, I'll be the best referee, you know, whatever, right? Like I, mm. I wouldn't make a great referee, I will say, but uh, you know, that's my point. And uh, the GM thing, I immediately went, oh, that's cool. Like that's a, because look, again, it comes back to the self-awareness thing. Uh, I understand that people see me a certain way, you know, I, 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 when I was, when I was doing the, when I was, when I formed the national treasure, Nick Aldis character uh, in the NWA, you know, I, I went back to basics. I went very sort of old school, in, or at least that's what people, you know, just described it as, as a throwback, right? I went very much on of that sort of Nick Bockwinkle, Harley race, a little bit of Ric Flair, you know, a little bit of, um Bret Hart you know very much to that sort of I'm gonna you know even even bits of Luthers and, and people like that thrown in there it was very much this like I'm going to present myself as a credible uh professional you know because I felt like that was a I felt like that was an underserved character at that point in time in wrestling like where we were at you know in 2018 was like Bullet Club was red hot um you know it was very much about like the sort of uh, anti-hero indie indie darling type of characters were really sort of all the rage right so I went okay I'm gonna go 180 degrees away from that and be I'm gonna wear a suit I'm gonna be clean cut I'm gonna be you know Johnny sophisticated you know professional athlete like carry you know and present the belt with like dignity and class and really make it feel like it's an it's the most important thing in the world uh I can only assume that some of that is what sort of influenced uh, Hunter's decision to, you know, to think that I would be a, a, you know, a good GM, right? Because it's, and look, I think again, from his point of view, he, he, even though he knows that a lot of the WWE universe are not familiar with, with my body of work or with my responsibilities outside of wrestling, he would know that enough people were that it would, it would have, have some credibility. Because to me, you know, that the GM spot, the first thing you have to have is credibility. If you don't have any credibility in that role, it's it's a completely pointless uh, character because everyone just goes, well, that you know, that, that's <laughs> that's just a guy, you know, doing a thing. It's just a guy playing a part, right? It's just a guy doing lines on TV. Um, so look, and I don't think it. And I, I don't think it hurts that people know that I work behind the scenes as well. So again, there's that thing of like, well, he does kind of help make some of the decisions. They don't know, you know, obviously, you know, <laughs> that to, to what extent they don't know, but I'm part of the process. So it there's a credibility there. And I think the same with Adam, you know, I think there was that understanding of like, well, he, he is, he does work behind the scenes. So he is kind of, he is kind of office, you know, no one really knows the sort of hierarchy or anything. So, um, I, I was just, like I said, I, I just understood that, okay, uh, if I'm going to make this work, 
I have to present myself as, you know, I had a certain, you know, I had a certain idea in mind. I had a certain, I had a certain sort of panache and a certain uh, sort of style that I had, I wanted to lend to it. And luckily uh, Hunter saw it the same way and, and we've sort of worked on it together and I think it's going well. Well, I was going to get three last things I want to ask you about. Um, I want to kind of go back in time a little bit because obviously you and Cody have a lot of history and you guys headlined the first All-In in 2018. You know, we know what came from that, the massive movement. And it always kind of struck me that you and Cody, in my eyes, were kind of the, the big match on that show, the match that really sold the show, the one match that people remember. And then afterwards, he we know he went on to all the big success that he had. And you had some success, but not on the same level that he did. How did you kind of deal with that as a performer that like you know you were holding up your part of the bargain for this massive show and then the other guy in it you know he skyrockets and you don't skyrocket as much um i think you have i think in this business you you know if you start playing the comparison game you can you know you can really you can really go down a a, a rabbit hole of bitterness and resentment very quickly mm -hmm. um you know, I felt a little bit betrayed uh, when I found out that they were all familiar. They were all aware of Tony Khan and they'd been sort of plotting this thing, you know. Um, and so then as we as we progressed, you know, a couple of months forward, it's sort of like, oh, that's all already that's all already happening. That's sort of a done deal. Um, and that, you know, so in that respect, you know, I guess I yeah, I guess I felt. Uh, you know, I felt like that I could have been informed of that sooner. But I just looked at it from the perspective of like, well, I, that that piece of business, meaning Cody and I all in that, that did nothing but good things for all of everyone involved. You know, it wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't like people looked and went, oh, well, he's finished, <laughs> you know. Right. Like we, you know, we, we tore the house down and we made, we, we had the match that everybody remembers. We had the, the real main event of that show. Um, and that built my credibility. And off the back of that, you know, we were able to launch an entire show that had a, a you know, at that time had a strong sustainable audience. Um, you know, so I, I, and I, and look, I, I, I landed a, a six figure contract off the back of that also you know cody obviously had a pipeline to a billionaire you know so <laughs> is it different you know i only had a millionaire you know he had a billionaire but you know whatever and uh you know it's all just part of the tapestry of your career right like i didn't i certainly didn't i certainly didn't resent cody i i was i was in it if anything i was grateful to cody uh because uh that show uh that the success of that show was certainly not the, the six like the, the, the they weren't going to sell those they sold those tickets no matter what right um i always say you know i didn't i didn't draw the house you know but i but i felt like i made the show what it was right like i felt like once you know once all in if you take cody and cody and i's match out of all in I think people remember it as a sort of really amazing achievement as a sort of, wow, like, a, like almost like a giant crowdfunding exhibit. Like this, wow, I can't believe that all these guys got together and they managed to sell 11,000 seats to a, to a arena. That's really cool. But I felt like what Cody and I's match did was, was kind of show that no, they can like, it can be done outside of WWE, you know, like a moment, you know, really like, storytelling emotion the big fight feel the, the you know the delivery of the of the big match and you know the 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 fairy tale ending can happen somewhere else you know with the right guys and look cody was the right guy but i was the right guy too i felt like it underlined me as as like this guy can do it too i don't want to put words in your mouth but do you think if there's a scenario where you were in the ring again that there's stuff to revisit there with you and cody absolutely you don't have to ask me you only have to you only have to look at the uh, the sentiment of fans <laughs> you know because they've never stopped talking about that since it happened even with everything that cody's done since 
And look, Cody's story will be studied, you know, throughout history uh, as a sort of as a masterful uh, piece of tactical, you know, risk taking as somebody in this business. Right. Um, Because he could have just he could have just sat pretty, you know, on a nice on a nice contract, making good money and just kind of, you know, he could have just sat in catering and kept you know kept making his money and and you know rode it out and probably got a behind the scenes role and you know and and been com- and got in that comfort zone but he didn't he, he you know he he took the risk he deserves the reward um and he's helped you know he's helped redefine you know and I think he's a, I think I think he is a a, a big part of the res- you know of the sort of renewed vigor that the business has and I think in that respect, so am I. You know, I, I played my little part in it, and I and and I'm proud of it. And I'm and so to be rewarded now with a spot in the bigs, you know, uh, I I feel like I earned it. Absolutely. And my last thing I want to ask you is kind of I mean, you know, at the beginning of 2023, if you'd said to somebody, okay, at the end of this year, Nick Aldis is going to be the SmackDown GM, and he's going to be on the show offering a contract to CM Punk. And getting him to sign with SmackDown, there's a few elements to that that you'd be like, all that together. So yeah. I guess my kind of two part last question is: Were you surprised to see Punk back legitimately? And also, you know, with in terms of your future as an on screen performer, where do you want it to to go? I was not surprised to see Punk uh, return to the WWE because <sighs> because CM Punk is a bona fide star and a proven money drawing commodity. And there's one place for those people to be. And it's WWE. There's one, there's really only one, even now there's really only one place for someone to maximize their uh, revenue generating potential. And that's WWE. And I even, ref- I sort of alluded to that in an interview shortly before he came back where, uh, at which point I had absolutely no, information i had no idea whether he was coming back or not but i said uh you know there is always a way when you move numbers and he moves numbers and uh i'm glad to see him back I, i've i've always liked punk um and i uh, i think that the business particularly wwe you know is driven by big matches big moments you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. And that's not one star. That's the big matches, the big moment, right? The, oh my God, we're going to get this person versus that person. That's the rising tide that lifts all boats. Because then somebody on the undercard goes, all right, hey, brand new audience have never seen me before. Watch this, you know. And next thing you know, a year from now, they're the rising tide. And that's how the business works, right? That's why we are in the most unbelievable position at this point in time. I mean, what a time to be in WWE. You know, I had a conversation with Road Dog a few weeks ago where he said, you know, Brian's always been... Uh, a, a sort of mentor to me and a, and a, and, a, and, got, and someone who sort of looked out for me. And he said, man, I'm so glad that you finally, you know, got a way in. And he goes, man, you couldn't have come at a better time. Like, I mean, what a time to be part of WWE, you know, Roman Reigns, Cody Rhodes, CM Punk, Seth Rollins, LA Knight's rise to superstardom, you know, Randy Orton, AJ Styles, like just to, there's just such a this that there is such a stacked top guy <laughs> roster at the moment, which means there is just such an unbelievable amount of money matches to do. And you know, Hunter has an embarrassment of riches, you know, to just like the it's it's simply a case of okay when oh oh and by the way uh the rock <laughs> yeah the the biggest celebrity in the world like a guy who 
pe people are legitimately uh, talking about as someone who could become the president of the United States. You know, oh, he just happens to to have just showed up and, uh, you know, laid down the gauntlet to Roman Reigns. So it's like to be in the company and not only not only uh, as an on-screen character that gets to rub up against, you know, these major players, uh, but also to be part of the process, you know, behind the scenes in sort of, you know, just to, you know, to be able to say, hey, what about this? You know, do you think, like, what if we did it like that? And for maybe for that to be the way it ends up being done. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, and, and for me, uh, as far as like where I want to go, uh, I want to be, uh, you know, a significant part of WWE programming, right? Like, I really, I, I really love where things are at for me at the moment. You know, I think that there's, I think we've, you know, we've really only scratched the surface. Um, I, you know, the, 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 the chemistry with Roman, I felt was very obvious and palpable. There's something there. There's a history with Cody, you know, there's, a history with LA Knight. I mean, there's just there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that can be done, but there's uh, but at the same time, there doesn't need to be any rush, uh, you know, to do any of those things. And like I said before, when I was talking about all of those different potential kind of attractions, those potential kind of money matches that can be made, hey, maybe at some point one of them could involve me. If it if if it's the right thing to do, if it's if it's good for business, if it's best for business, you know, and all I can do is is uh, uh, you know deliver, you know, my role as best I can, and then if at that time that opportunity presents itself, you can you can bet that I'll be ready to deliver that too.